Do you love Funko products and pop culture collectibles? Of course you do. So visit our newest sponsor, vidguycollectibles.com. That's V-I-D-E guycollectibles.com for a wide assortment of the goodies you need to get your hands on. Here's the best part. Enter promo code PARLAPOD at checkout for 10% off. All the cool stuff that you want and you save money. Doesn't get any better than that. Don't forget to give them a visit and use the PARLAPOD discount code. Now let's start the show. With no power comes no responsibility. Hi everybody, this is John Semper. This is Ming Chen. This is Nancy Collins. This is Chris Riley. Hey guys, this is Jim Mafood. I'm Joshua Hill Fialka. Hey, this is Tim Seeley. Hey folks, this is Brian O'Halloran. Hey, what up? This is Jason Muse, and you're listening to Parlapod.com Comic Book Podcast. Snooch to the nooch. It was terrible casting. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Fantastic. Oh, okay. Yeah, maybe I'm just nuts, but that should be public record by now. Yeah, I lied. I had my fingers crossed behind my back. This is why I wanted to get it over with no, at the beginning. No, 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 what? You are, this is the happiest I, I've seen you in a long time. Introducing the Thunder Pedal Parla Pet. Absolutely, that shit makes me happy all day long. We're just a little disjointed right now. Really cool. Fuck, I shouldn't have said that. Yeah, they thought, okay, this is kind of wacky, this is kind of fun stuff. Um, Hey there, comic book fans. Thanks for tuning in to Parlapod. On this episode, we'll be talking Suicide Squad number 26, Detective Comics number 965, and traveling back to 1989 and revisiting the lonely place of dying Batman crossover. I'm one of your hosts, David Schultz. Normally, I'm joined by John Benedict, but he's away covering a con. So I'm pleased to have Mr. Sean Haggerty on the show. Sean how are you, buddy? I'm doing great, Dave. I'm I'm happy to be here. Uh, I was thrilled when you asked if I could sit in, and uh, um, I'm I'm excited to be back. Right on, dude. What's new with you, man? What's been going on since the uh, last time you've been on the show? Oh, just living life, living the dream day by day. You know how it goes. Um, you know, football season's back in full swing. I love me some football. It's been Damn, fun. Skippy. Uh, I'm kind of a video game guy myself, so uh, Destiny 2 came out recently. I'm enjoying the hell out of that, so that's been taking up a little bit of free time. Uh, uh, recently read the Star Wars uh, first arc of uh, Star Wars Darth Vader that Cullen Bunn wrote. I'm really enjoying that, but uh, otherwise mostly work and comics and games. God, you were so nerdy. Star Wars and video games. Yeah, you know, proud that- of it. Thankfully, we're both in the same fantasy football league, so that kind of ups your cred with me. I can dig that. Two it's got a funky beat. Yeah, two of them. I, I can dance to that, man. <laughs> Again, the funky beat, you know? So, uh, yeah. Sean, listen, you know, uh, normally John does a little segment on the show called All In or No Dice that deals with the headlines in the comic book world that we need to know about. But you have volunteered to fill in. Are you ready to hit us with some all in or no dice? First story we got is a source at Fox confirms that Noah Hawley, writer and showrunner of Legion on FX, has been tapped to develop a Doctor Doom feature film. Dave, all in or no dice? No dice. Well, I am all in. All right, I know we can't elaborate, but you got to give me a good Fantastic Four film before you can give me a Doctor Doom film. Damon Lindelof of Lost Fame has been hired to write the pilot of the new HBO series The Watchmen based on the Alan Moore comic series. Dave, all in or no dice? All in, dude. Come on. Uh, I am no dice on this one, Dave. Oh, jeez Louise. Come on, dude. What? How could you not be enthusiastic about that? You're a Lost uh, fan. I was. And I was. Was is the key word. Did you did you watch the last season of Lost? I did. That's your only thing? Oh, the, the, the last episode sucked. Oh, I don't want to do a Watchmen. The entire last season sucked, first of all. Not the last, but the entire last season was pointless. Um, 
you know, and I might get, you know, shot on Twitter for this, but uh, I'm not the biggest Watchmen fan in the world. I, it, At it's good, 10K it's Beers, go and assassinate <laughs> this man's character right now. All right, what do you get next? Marvel's December solicits announced the return of adult Jean Grey to the Marvel Universe. She's been gone for a long time. Uh, it's a five-part series titled Phoenix Resurrection, and it releases December 27th. Dave, all in, or no dice? No dice! You know, I'm with you on this one. No dice for me as well. Next up, uh, DC Universe Holiday Special 2017 will hit the shelves on December 6th and will retail at a whopping $9.99. But the special will include a Batman story from iconic creator Denny O'Neill and also a Swamp Thing story. Dave, what do you think of this? All in or no dice? No dice. No dice. No way. Ah, it's so tough because I so want anything Swamp Thing, but I got to go no Dude, dice on this one. I so. love Denny O'Neill. I love Swamp Thing. But that price point is ridiculous. Yes. No I way, agree, Jose. No. 100%. DC announces in a creator shakeup that they will be switching the writers of Green Lanterns and Nightwing. Recent Parlapod interviewee Tim Seeley's run on Green Lantern will hit the shelves this October, and former Green Lantern scribe Sam Humphreys will helm Nightwing. Dave, are you all in or no dice? All in on Green Lanterns, which has been a title I couldn't stand. Sam Humphreys, no way. No, no, just not. I'm sorry, but no. So you're going to you're going to start buying Green Lanterns now is what you're saying? I'll check it out. Tim Seeley. Oh can, yeah? Tim Seeley's one hell of a writer, dude. All right. Well, I am all in on both of them to be honest with you. Fantastic, Shawnee boy. Nice job filling in for John. I love it. Um, I, I didn't keep a tally on what I was all in or no dicing, but still, you know what? It's guttural. Uh, I had no access to this news, really, before you kind of threw it at me. So I like that. I love that part of the show. Big shoes to fill in with John not here, so I, I try. You did a good job, buddy. Good job. So what do you say now we discuss a brand new book that just got released today? In Suicide Squad number 26. Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Brand spanking new and just for you. These books are hot off the rack. All right, man. Suicide Squad number 26. Metal tie-in Gotham Resistance Part 3. Written by Rob Williams with art by Styapon Sayich. And I hope I got that right. I know it's, it's you been practice a, it. I, I've been practicing all day. All friggin' day. Because listen, he his art <laughs> I can tell you this right out the, out of the gate. His art is phenomenal, and I really didn't want to screw up his name. Good God, is this guy talented or what? Yeah, it's it's it really is something. I'd I thought it was a little overly digital when I started reading it, but boy, after the first couple of frames, I was like, no, this I, I see exactly what he's going for here. It is a nice blend between between classic art and the digital. Um, I, I was. I was really impressed. Well, actually, he's the artist, the regular artist on Aquaman, which is an excellent book right now uh, released from DC. DC's releasing a lot of great books. If you really want to check out some of his... Uh, Outstanding artwork. Make sure you check out the current run of Aquaman. So let's talk a little bit about the story. In the beginning, we find out that Amanda Waller wants the Suicide Squad to solve the whole issue with the fact that Challenger's Mountain has appeared in Gotham City. Nice little notes about this was that Killer Croc, who, you know, is a villain, but he, he's very sensitive about the fact that Gotham is in fact his city yeah yeah actually um i found killer croc one of the more interesting characters in this book i enjoyed the whole wrangled group here uh, green arrow is with them too which i i am a big reader of green arrow and uh surprised to to see how he's mixed up in this motley crew as well but the thing about this book too is that we see that flashback it was 18 hours earlier and then we're Jumped into the future, and the world is basically like a whole Mad Max kind of fuckery thing going on with a whole team of Damian Wayne, Nightwing, Green Arrow, Harley Quinn, and Killer Croc are in a crazy school bus. And you'd think they're driving in the desert, just out of control, 
but they are in fact in Gotham City, and their goal is to reach this mountain. Right, right. And they're being chased by a horde of some sort of crazy flying creatures as well. I've never been a big Harley Quinn fan. There's even a moment right here that she kind of breaks the fourth wall down and talks to the readers as she's careening the bus out of control. But they land in, it seems like a nest of vines, and we discover that Poison Ivy is the villain of the issue, so to speak. But I really dug the moment that Harley is upset because Poison Ivy, they're supposed to be friends, right? And she actually stops the bus that was careening out of control, about to dive down a cliff with some vines. And this was a line that I really enjoyed where she's like, oh my god, you remember me, we're, we're friends. And Ivy's like, I caught you as a spider catches a fly. You are food to be liquidized and then consumed. Bad fucking ass. That yeah, is so yeah, dope. No. And that's the whole thing. It's part of this whole metal thing is the, the Batman who laughs is given this like, this kind of sounds cheesy. I understand it. But there's like a power card to a bunch of the villains uh, from Gotham, Batman's uh, baddies, if you will. And they're all supposed to be supercharged or empowered by this and own little territories of Gotham City. This bus going out of control has just entered Poison Ivy's territory. You know what I mean? So I I just like how cold-hearted she is. I thought that was very interesting and it made her character more appealing to me. Now, as the story progresses, we discover that there were evil versions of the Titans There were evil versions of the Suicide Squad, and they have been sent by said Batman who laughs to take Nightwing, Damien, because they they hold some sort of importance to him. He's like, those souls matter to me. And it was kind of a cool uh, panel where Starfire looks pretty evil with a sinister Joker smile and uh, almost looks like a zombie flying out of nowhere. Oh, yeah, that was a great panel. She looked fantastic in it with the glowing green fists. And yeah, yeah, I remember that. Right, that's pretty rad, and we find out that they're led by the Dark Matter version of Damian Wayne. These characters now create a battle, which any comic book fan wants to see, right? You want to see teammate versus teammate, friend versus friend. And these are now evil, right, these are now evil characters. That was kind of fun, that was kind of cool action. And as much as we appreciated the art, I gotta admit, this this is kind of like a good old-fashioned superhero funnery. Is funnery a word? It is now. It is. I just created it. It is in Dave land. This is a good thing about the story. It had a nice little uh, mix of action, nice little mix of humor. So credit to Rob Williams on this one. And like you said, you're not really familiar with Suicide Squad. I haven't read too much of it either. But overall, this issue so far has been pretty enjoyable. Can you kind of go with me on that one? Are you you in the same boat? Absolutely. I thought it was absolutely fun. Yeah, it... It's not so much of a deep thinker of a book, but it, it's a lot of fun. And it just makes me want to almost pick it up and read it all over again. Exactly. I mean, we get Killer Croc, who's totally in his, like, again, Mad Maxian armor, who jumps out. And uh, they even they even talk about his battle cry, which is basically, I'm going to eat your face. <laughs> That's pretty he's not dope. Beating around the bush. No, yeah. he's 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 out on Front Street with it. I do have to say the whole thing with Nightwing and the whole group trying to reach the center of Challenger's Mountain was very kind of Lord of the Rings Frodo for me. Uh, so yeah, I can I can see that. You can see, yeah, you know. But overall, man, this is this was a really enjoyable issue. It's worth your money. Yeah, without a doubt, it's definitely a recommend for me. All right, buddy, we're going to take a quick commercial break, and then when we come back, we're going to kind of like uh, analyze something. You into analyzation? I am way into analyzation. You own rubber gloves? I rent them. I have a lease with an option to buy. When we come back, we're going to talk about Detective Comics number 965, but first, we're going to talk about the original event that spawned it. A lonely place of dying. All the way back from 1989. Are you ready to hop into a time machine with me? Would you be able to sit in a DeLorean with me? There's not a lot of room in a DeLorean, and I am a large man, but, you know, I'll give it a shot. Okay, cool. Awesome. I'll see you on the other side. Are you afraid of what goes bump in the night? Have you or your friends ever pondered a conspiracy? Do you want to know more about the unknown? If so, then put on your tinfoil hat, sit down, and pick up your computer, tablet, or phone. 
Go to iTunes or YouTube and search for Secret Transmission Podcast and listen to us try to explain the unexplainable. Follow us on Twitter for updates on shows. At Secret Trans Pod. That's S-E-C-R-E-T. T-R-A-N-S-P-O-D. Or you can email us suggestions at secrettransmission at hotmail.com. That's S-E-C-R-E-T-T-R-A-N-S-M-I-S-S-I-O-N at hotmail.com. Dave from Parlapod.com here. If you're a collector, you know tracking your books can really be a chore. And chores are boring. Aww. But with the CLZ app from Collectors.com, not only do they make tracking your books easy, they make it fun. The app has a barcode scanner, so you can enter books in a flash. Maybe, like me, you have years worth of comics that need sorting. No problem. Search their online database and upload all of your issues at once. Here's something that's great. Issues summaries are included publishers creative teams release dates variants story notes yep it's all there at your fingertips got the app but need to change devices no worries with a clz cloud everything you have is saved Ah. don't wait you can download the trial and paid version via all your favorite app stores and for more information visit them at collectors that's collectors with a z dot com don't forget to tell them parlapod sent you the clz app from collectors.com there is no better solution to a problem that has plagued us forever start using it you can thank me later gentlemen let's broaden our minds lawrence All right, Sean, I have a serious question for you. I hope you're ready to answer. Lay it on me. What were you doing in 1989? Uh, 1989. I would have been in sixth grade. Um, I would have been doing a whole lot of, you know, same, same thing I'm doing right now in my life. I would have been playing video games and I would have been reading a lot of comics. I'm very lucky. Because in my hometown of Webster, Massachusetts, we had a hobby store, we had smoke shops, we had convenience stores, and every place was well stocked in comics. Nowadays, you can't go to, I don't know, a supermarket or what have you and pick up the same books that you could. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Uh, I work at a pharmacy, actually, and we have a small rack of comics with about 10 titles on it, and I... I kind of chuckle to myself because it's mostly stuff for the kids, you know. But, uh, you know, that's about it in my small town. I, as a kid, I struggled to find it. I didn't live in Webster. Shout out to Webster. And, Damn uh, right. And uh, I, I didn't uh, – it was tough for me. Uh, we luckily had a local flea market. And uh, so you'd see a lot of that kind of stuff, you know, comic books um, mixed in with the penthouses and stuff like that that people would be selling at the flea market. So – that was my main place of getting comics as a kid. And mixed a lot of hand-me-downs in, from my older mi- cousins. Mixed in with the penthouses, you say, eh? Sure, oh yeah. They they were all over in the flea market, too. Penthouses, playboys, yeah. Also very oh. popular in the flea market crowd. Well, I can tell you from my perspective, a lonely place of dying, the whole thing, was very important to me as a kid. Events were very, very cool. It was something special. I actually didn't uh, read this when it was uh, brand new as a kid. I wasn't reading a lot of Batman at that time. Um, It is something I did read, though, in my early 20s when I started getting into Batman pretty hard. So it was nice to revisit it again for for the show here. Great thing about 1989 was the Batman movie was released. Who didn't? fucking go gaga over batman in 1989 no no, nobody i knew was not into batman yeah i even though i wasn't reading the books very much at the time i was excited to see that movie yeah did you see the movie in the theaters or no oh yeah oh yeah without a doubt i thought that car was the coolest thing i'd ever seen on a big screen ever so you know as a kid who was very lucky to have a bunch of comics available at the time our lonely place of dying was a huge fucking event i mean it it followed up a death in the family where we saw the death of jason todd to this day i'm still kind of bitter about i know he's back in comics it doesn't matter you're always back 
But for me, Jason Todd was always my Robin. I didn't want him to die. Oh, my God. What? What? Oh, no. I No. Well, go ahead. I mean, I'm glad. Go, He's got to go, be somebody's go, go. Robin, but Jason what, Todd what? sucks. What? 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 He's the what? worst Robin. Why? Well, no. Damian Wayne's the worst Robin. Jason Todd God, sucks. Thank though. you. Thank you. But why would Jason Todd suck? He was the kid was a jerk. He was he was an asshole. He was he was a thief who was just kind of a I don't know. I never liked him. Never liked the character. Okay, that's it. That's your only defense. You hated Well, Jason it's a Todd. pretty good reason. I don't like the character. Is a pretty I find his personality off putting. The same reason I hate Damian Wayne. He's a spoiled little prick. Jason Todd's just a uh, um, I don't know. He's a he thinks he's funny. He's not. He's I don't he's just an asshole. He d- he doesn't he didn't feel like the Robin who earned the spot to me. Dick so, Grayson was the Robin who earned the spot. In retrospect, seeing his brains beat out with a crowbar by the Joker would be appealing to you. I enjoyed it again. Yes, I I I know we were reading a lonely place of dying, uh, but uh, I actually did reread a Death in the Family as well, just because I know I enjoyed that. So. I wanted to do that again as well. And that was in late 88, early in 89, written by Jim Starlin with art by Jim Aparo in the Batman books. This one was a crossover between Batman and the New Titans, formerly known as the Teen Titans. Uh, It was a five-parter. This one was done by Marv Wolfman, George Perez, Jim Aparo. And an interesting thing was also that George Perez was a co-plotter. I really enjoyed rereading it this time. I don't know if it's like the most stellar written book, but it's it's almost a good case study of how to create a character who is likable right from the start. Right from the get-go, as you meet Tim Drake, you want to like him. He's enthusiastic. He's not looking to become Robin. That's the last thing he's looking to do. And uh, he's... Supposedly. Uh, <laughs> oh, you think he had? You think you think he's playing I, everybody? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, maybe he's smart enough to be. He's that smart. He figured out who uh, Batman and uh, Dick Grayson. Uh, right. That that Dick Grayson was Nightwing and that Bruce Wayne was Batman. He figured that out on all all on his own. He's just a kid. All right. To refresh listeners, part one happened in Batman number four forty, entitled Suspects. Part two, the New Titans number sixty, entitled Roots. Part 3, Batman number 441, Parallel Lines. Part 4, The New Titans, number 61. Part 5, Batman number 442, which has an interesting title in Rebirth, which we're all very familiar with today. Again, 1989 was the height of Batman fever. Tim Drake, his name was even inspired by the director of the Batman movie, Tim Burton. I have to tell you right now, rereading this whole event, I'm very disturbed by clowns <laughs> is that due to just what you're reading in here or is that due to some other events that may have happened to you the clowns are very disturbing to me because just to give kind of like a synopsis to everybody like you said tim drake's a very really smart kid whatever and we don't really see him at the beginning of the arc uh besides like an arm or a leg but batman is off the rails He's reckless, he's crazy, he can't control himself, and we also discover that Nightwing needs to find his roots. Hence the the title of New Titans number 60, where he returns to Haley's Circus, and he wants to kind of, I don't know, what's a good way to put this, Sean? It's almost like he's on a, on a, on a journey to find himself, and he has to start back at square one. Right. And that is Haley's Circus. And throughout this entire run, you you see this, I don't know, I, again, I want to say creepy, like the clown. He is like a fucking clown. You're talking clown, about it, the alcoholic clown that works at the circus? Well, no, now I'm talking about Tim Drake. Because there's someone oh, stalking, yes. there's someone fucking stalking Dick Grayson and Titan's Tower and everything else. Someone's taking pictures and you're like, who is this guy? It has to be a supervillain. It has to be like Lex Luthor or someone really sinister. But no. It turns out that there is a Batman fan. There is a Batman and Robin fan out there. A super fan. A fanboy, if you will. He's literally stalking them. You're, you're right. He's. It is. Yeah. You're right. It's a little odd. But how does this relate to the clown? Well, the, the, no, no, no. It doesn't. The clowns are just fucking creepy. Because there's like images of clowns like smiling. <laughs> 
yeah. yeah. And you're like, okay, cool, George Perez. Okay, cool, Tom Grummet. I'm glad you drew some clowns in the background of a circus, but damn, it's freaking me the fuck out. Well, it's supposed Truly to. Isn't that freaky. one of the? That's that's one of the the plot points is that when Tim Drake was there as a child, he was uh, startled by the clowns as well. So they're supposed to be a little creepy, right? I mean. That's what they were going uh, for. Yeah, he just said he was freaked out by the circus. That was his thing. He just scared nah, you're of just, the circus. You're just scared of clowns. The whole story is just basically about introducing Tim Drake, right? Batman needs a Robin. That's the whole thing. And I'm not a big Robin fan. I've never felt that Batman necessarily does need a sidekick. No, I prefer either, him. Actually. Yeah, I prefer him without a sidekick. Yeah, I, I would agree. I like... Most of my favorite Batman stories are are Batman on his own stories, or sometimes like like in an entire group. I enjoy that as well. But Batman and Robin, no, I I've never been a big fan. But you know, if if I were to pick one, it would be either Tim Drake or Dick Grayson. You know, there were some great moments though in this whole crossover between New Titans and Batman. One of which is that. Speedy in Titans number 61 lays down a Yahoo serious reference and he gets serious kudo points from me. <laughs> Besides, yeah, I was going to say, you know, back then everybody would have gotten the Yahoo serious reference, but uh, how many people now would get the Yahoo serious reference? None. Absolutely zero, Sean. <laughs> I got you know it. What? You got it. There's a I, few of us weird. You got it too? There. You got it too? Oh, I got it too. Oh, isn't that awesome? Don't you just picture him yes. in like a, the, the bathtub, like playing the violin in, yeah. in the, the back? Yeah, well, oh, was how, it a cockat- cockatoo or something that was hanging on him all the time? How awesome is that? How fucking awesome is that? Before you actually, it, the, the thing is revealed about Tim Drake. You just see like the arm or the leg. I keep thinking it's like a teenage kid running around dressed up like Jerry Seinfeld or like Abe Vigoda. His style was not very cool. You know what I mean? Well, it's not like any of them were dressed too terribly flashy. I, I remember thinking that uh, Dick Grayson, who's supposed to be in his 20s, looked like he was dressing like a 70-year-old man at the time, too. So It's like, how much can you love Jim Aparo? A lot, right? He is like the oh, quintessential Batman, Batman artist. Some guys will go off about Neil Adams. Others will go off about Aparo. But <laughs> in this arc, it's like Tim Drake is dressed like a, I don't know. He, he's not He's not the coolest dude on the face of the earth. No. No, but look, look, look what Robin wears. Robin is not the coolest dude on the face of the earth. He actually encounters Dick. Dick Grayson is like, dude, I know who you are. Because I was at Haley's Circus the night that your parents died. Okay? I know the tumble that you made, the leap that you made, which is kind of ridiculous. But again, we're talking way back in the day. But still, he, he's putting, he's connecting the dots, right? He's putting everything together. I said he was a little kid watching people die in front of him. I would imagine that made an impact on him, that the memory would be sharp in his mind from a day like that. Yeah, but, I mean, realistically, to realize that not only is Dick Grayson Robin, but Bruce Wayne is Batman. And we're talking about a character who's supposed to be genius-level intellect here. They, re- I mean, Tim Drake really is. I know he's just a kid here, but... He is one of the smartest people in the Bat family. Well, the funny thing is, is how fast the trajectory is. Because Dick is like, yeah, man, you're, you're a smart little, smart little cookie. You know what? You, yeah. you should be helping us out. You should be with us, you know? While Batman's like, fuck that. No way. I'm a fucking rebel. And he doesn't understand what's going on. Because the whole time, and we haven't mentioned this yet, is that there's a lot of crimes happening, a lot of scenarios happening, and it ends up being Two-Face is the culprit or the mastermind behind everything. But he's listening to a radio, which is influencing his decisions, like talking to him personally, dude. I love Two-Face. He's one of my favorite Bat villains. Oh, I do too, but he's tuned into WGCN, which obviously has to be one of the worst radio stations of all time. <laughs> Kill the Batman. Why? <laughs> I don't think everybody's hearing the things he's hearing on WGCN. No, no, but the thing is, give him clues. Like, do everything. And, and Two Face has to do everything in twos. Everything's Gemini or. 
Yeah. And, and Marv Wolfman, credit to him, man. He he really laid it out very well, as far as like the whole connection of the two sides of each coin and, and what have you. I like that they even show that that uh, that even Two Face struggles to keep coming up with ideas on how to come up with you know double sided crimes and crimes that involve the number two. It, I always think the writers must struggle to always do that with Two Face, and the fact that they actually wrote that into the plot that even Two Face struggles to come up with good uh, plans that incorporate too. I, th- I thought that was great too. Well, he has that 1940s style radio, right? Yeah, right. Influencing every fucking decision. Despite the fact that Tim Drake is obviously a stalker and that's how he gets introduced into the Batman mythos. He's taking pictures of everything. And that's another thing that I find weird is like he's outside of Starfire's apartment who's like obviously a super hottie in the yeah, DCU. Looks- <laughs> yeah, she oh she looks good to you well i mean to other people she's like again like a supermodel and he doesn't take photos of her he just decides to knock on her door where is dick where is he he's and she's knocking like, on you fucking... fire's door looking for dick yeah looking for <laughs> yeah exactly and she's like who the fuck are you you little weirdo and he runs away so but again, uh, after his identity is revealed and we know he's this little super smart dude who dresses very strange and uh, can't make good decisions when it comes to taking pictures. Uh, anyway, he doesn't want to be the Robin. He's trying to insinuate that Dick needs to return to the role of Robin, that Batman needs him. That's why Batman's out of control, dude. Robin grounds Batman. That's his argument, that 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 Batman needs to be grounded and that, that Robin is the connection that Batman can't have to the rest of the world. In the story, Nightwing goes off to help Batman and Batman is kind of surprised. He didn't realize from the get-go that it was, in fact, Two-Face. Batman was so blinded and so, I don't know, obtuse to the entire fact because... I'm without Jason Todd. I'm a fucking rebel motherfucker. He was trying to set his own trap at the same time, too. He was trying to lay a trap for Two-Face once he figured out it was Two-Face. But, yeah, you know, he, he caught on. He's just a little slow on the uptake here in this one. But, that, you'd like like you said, he's lost in in mourning of, of, of his friend. His ward. His sidekick. Right, he he doesn't want a new Robin, but that's the kicker, man. That's what happens in this story. This moment when Nightwing shows up, and Batman says, and it's very telling when he's talking to Nightwing. He says, "I need, I could use your help," and Nightwing smiles because Nightwing knows you need me. You you actually freaking need me, Bruce, Mister Tough Guy. Mr. Yeah. Batman, Mr. Right, you you need this. You need me. You complete me. He actually slips up a couple of times and almost calls him Robin too. No, you're right, and that's that's kind of cool, man. And that's credit to Marv Wolfman again for crafting a a fairly intelligent story. Yeah, without a doubt, uh, a good character story. You know, even if there's not a real, you know, deep intense plot going on it's a really good character story not just about actually not about bruce as much as it is about both dick and this new character tim interestingly enough tim does in fact don the robin gear or the garb and heads out because a building blew up and nightwing and batman are in fact trapped it is his opportunity to shine and alfred is his like wingman you know what i mean yeah, it's a good thing Dick just let him into the Batcave. I, I have to admit, I thought that was a little odd. Just like, hey, you figured us out. Come on in. You know. So Tim Drake saves the day. Batman insists he doesn't want a ward, even though he basically just, uh, I don't know, man, uh, brought home the bacon. You know what I mean? It was like he was a provider. Batman was in trouble. Nightwing is in trouble. Tim Drake showed up and biggity bam, biggity boom. He saved the day. Yep. That's how it. That's how it all goes down at the end. It's fantastic. One great moment in this, though, man, I gotta admit, is like uh, a death in the family. Was Jason Todd was killed by the Joker with the crowbar, and in this, yeah. Two Face takes a crowbar to Tim Drake. 
He's like, welcome to the Robin Club, man. I'm about to smack you in the face with a crowbar. You know, I was this like. This is your initiation. This is your initiation. Exactly. At the end of everything, once we do kind of reveal the source, we find out that the voice in the radio, he was being influenced by the Joker. <laughs> that damn Joker. Oh, that was good. Sean, let me tell you something right now. Tim Drake is a stalker. He loves Batman and Robin. He's a fanboy, right? He, but the thing he's a is, big fan of Dick. He loves the Dick, who eventually gets to live his dream. He dons the Robin costume. He saves the day. But listen, that trajectory is eerily similar to you, Mister Sean Haggerty, who likes my show, digs my Uh-oh. show, and he has earned a co-hosting duty on Parlapod. I yeah. You are as, the Tim as long Drake as I don't Parlapod. start trying on John Benedict's clothes like Tim Drake does at the end of this, I think we're okay, though. All right, so Sean, overall, was this a comic that you dug? Is it something that you could recommend to other people, this whole event? Oh, without a doubt, uh, especially if you have any interest in Batman whatsoever. It's really it's really key to understanding the progression of, of the Robins, at least, you know, Um introduction to tim drake is who is still currently you know red robin in continuity today so i enjoyed it very much it's it's a great comic and i would recommend it to anybody you should absolutely read it if you're a fan batman dc anything the story necessarily wasn't great okay it wasn't the best story ever written um but the nostalgia factor is breaking the fucking meter You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and we're about to talk about a a new story, Detective Comics number 965, which is entitled A Lonely Place of Living. And for me, if you want to fucking stick your finger in my nostalgia, uh, at least have it home by midnight. You know what I mean? Like, be careful where you tread. So, you know, it's still an important story that any Batman fan should definitely check out if you haven't already. So now we're talking about homage. Okay, Sean, why is someone now creating an event or talking about an event and using the same title, using the same covers, using the same everything as something that happened 28 years ago? And that leads us into Detective Comics number 965, A Lonely Place of Living, Part 1, written by James Tinian IV, with art by Eddie Barrows. You are a regular reader of Detective Comics, do you feel like it is up to speed? Yeah, yeah. Tim Drake has been presumed dead by the Bat Team for a while at this point, and we as the reader have known that that was not the case, that he wasn't dead, that he was just captured by this Mr. Oz fellow. And um, so I see why they're connecting it back to a, a lonely place of dying, because everybody is assuming that Robin was dead once again. But this is uh, the Bat Team discovering that that might not be the case. Well, here's the thing, dude. This ish starts out more like an episode of Dr. Phil. Because Tim Drake is giving Mr. Oz a recap of basically what happened in A Lonely Place of Dying. His origin. Right. I didn't realize it was going to be so connected. to. I, th- I thought maybe the, the title and the, and the cover was just a reference to that point. But it really did tie into the to the old story. I'm glad you had us reread it. I dug the fact that they kind of recapped it. Because there's a whole new generation who may have not read A Lonely Place of Dying. And that's cool. I mean, the story was the same. The the visuals were different. But there's also a the nice word, bit. word for word, though. It was pretty much the same script. They just it was. Uh, they gave uh, they updated the clothing that you were just complaining about a little bit ago. Yeah, right, right. He wasn't dressed like Abe Vigoda. No, he was not. No, you're right. But the thing was, is it also like gave a dimension to Tim Drake that I maybe I didn't recognize before because I'm a comics curmudgeon and I'm a dick. And you love Jason Todd. I love that Chase and Todd. But the thing was, is like he's establishing the, the whole support network for Batman. And he even says to Mr. Oz, he's like, everybody views Batman as a solitary figure. But basically, he's always needed other people. He knows that Batman's no good on his own. He's seen it firsthand. He knew it when he was a kid. He definitely knows it now. He's a pretty smart cookie. And when Mr. Oz is like, you don't have to answer my questions if you don't want to. 
uh, with this interrogation. But Tim's like, well, no, no, no. It takes less brain power to tell the truth and buying time to hack into your whole prison system and take over the computer. Yeah, he hacked in. He hacked in while he was just uh, stalling Mr. Oz. It's very cool. That is cool. But one thing I kind of thought was uh, foreshadowing and the end was kind of like predictable was Mr. Oz was talking about Batman and his virtues and Tim's like, I never want to be the Batman. I'm, I don't want to do that. That's not my path. And later on in the story, Mr. Oz is like, dude, this wasn't a prison to begin with. You're free to go. And he hears a distress call and he thinks it's Batman. And Batman's like, open up gate number six, whatever. And he's like, okay, dude. Because he's like a cowering, I don't know, weak child. He's scared. He's alone. And it went from smart cookie to kind of pathetic for me. I don't know if I agree completely with pathetic. That's a pretty pretty strong swing in the other direction. But there again, it's a bit of a, you have to suspend belief a little bit. Because he's a genius one second. And then he's kind of falling into what a reader would see coming as an obvious trap a mile away. That's what I would do, right? But, but I'm a loser. I'd be like, oh my god, I'm fucking alone. I've got nowhere to go. I'm trapped. Mayday, mayday. But once he opens the gates with his his computer hacking, if you will, and he runs down the corridor and he's like, I'm going to find Batman. Batman is safe. He's with me. Uh, We find out a shocker. A shocker, Sean, right? That Batman is carrying a gun. And most people might think maybe he's Thomas Wayne or what have you. But again, this is where I kind of found it a little, I don't know, cookie cutter. It is a Tim Drake Batman. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to hold off before I make too much of a judgment on that. Like I said, I'm going to keep reading this story. I'm going to keep reading this arc no matter what because I'm enjoying it anyway. But I'm a little hesitant on that too. Uh, That didn't strike me as something I was super cool with when he took off his cowl and it was Tim Drake underneath and eh, eh, okay. I mean, it didn't necessarily see it coming, but it, it, it did feel a little, it, would you say cookie cutter? That's a good term for it. Robin or, or Tim Drake had released every prisoner because he thought he heard Batman's voice, which in fact was his own. And once he does discover, Oh my God, you're me or an alternate version of me. The wall breaks down and it's motherfucking doomsday. The big reveal at the end. Did you like that or what? I don't I don't know if I like that or not. I'm not necessarily a big doomsday fan. We'll see. We'll see. T- you know, Tynion's are he's he's done well so far. He's finished these arcs, even the ones I've been hesitant about in the beginning. He usually finishes them well. It's like he's the opposite of Tom King. Um and I think I think he'll be okay. I think it'll be good. Uh, Sean, other than the initial recap we talked about with The Lonely Place of Dying, I really don't see the significance of using the Lonely Place moniker anymore. This issue really didn't... Uh, Okay, listen. In the beginning, they kind of did it in verbatim, but what the future may hold, Doomsday busting out of the wall, and the future Tim Drake, I really don't get it other than trying to appeal to, again, the nostalgia factor. Well, I'm, I'm sure they're trying to sell comics. That's the whole idea. I mean, that, that plays uh, a part. Oh, yeah. I think it connects in still pretty well because A Lonely Place of Dying was a story about Jason Todd having died, and here we meet Tim Drake. And now we're at a point in Detective Comics where they all thought Tim Drake was dead, and so it, it almost feels like they've been mourning Robin once again. So... But this is now the opposite of that. It's a lonely place of living. It's like he's coming back to life. I I see why they're using the I see why they're using the the title as kind of an homage to the old one. It, it makes sense to me. But but is it necessary? No, it's not necessary. But why 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 not? Why do you find the old title so untouchable that you can't pay homage to it now? No, I don't, Sean. It's not not it's not even that. Okay, for me, it's like bell bottom pants. So to reuse the name, reuse the cover images, again, like we talked about, the homage is like, hey man, this is like the, the reproduction of Batman number 441, but instead we have Tim Drake holding up the Red Robin costume with, with um, the, the rest of Batwoman and Clayface and whoever in the background instead. 
that's cool. But it's not enough to sell me on the event. It's not enough to, like, hook me. It makes me more weary. It makes me worry more about what they're going to do and how they're going to treat it as a whole. I think they're hoping that the book itself is going to, to sell itself to you, that, that Tynan's writing is going to sell it to you. I think they're, I think you're seeing the, the use of the title as just purely a selling point. And sometimes it's just paying respect to the past. Okay, I dig that. But listen, if they just had a different event, let's say they called it, I don't know, come up with something, Sean. Come up with something random. Um, anything. Tim Drake uh, Resurrection. <laughs> yeah, cotton candy, cotton candy, happy unicorns. That's fine. But the moment they call it or, or make it resemble something that is nostalgic to my youth, the bar is set higher. It's not just like you're doing your own thing now. Now you're tying it to the past. And it doesn't even matter if the past was good, but the fact is people love it. People remember it fondly like I do. Yeah. You have to come out of the gate strong. You have to make it worth our while. Otherwise, call it anything the fuck you want to call it. Just don't dick with our childhoods. No, no, I can't. I can't side with you on this. I think, I think. It's... Well, you, you didn't have a childhood. <laughs> I was I was a child once. I think I think Detective Comics is a great. I think you don't like Detective Comics. I think Detective Comics is really good right now. And if anybody is going to attempt to to do a story that is named after a classic storyline, I think this is the book to do it in. And I think it's going to be good. And it's just been the first issue. And we need to we need to see where it goes. I. I'm I'm standing by it. Shit on it all you want. Wham, bam, fucking thank you, ma'am. But I mean, realistically, Sean, mm -hmm. uh, did this meet your expectations? Did this kind of like have that effect that you needed to make you go, wow? No, not yet, not yet. But it's been it's the first issue, and the first issue of the of the old story. A uh, Lonely Place of Dying didn't exactly blow me away either. It's not complete yet, and I think I'm 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 hanging in there, but. I it's going to be good when it's all said and done. All of his other arcs have been great and you're right, he did up the bar by naming it this. And Yes, okay. Sean, I will admit this. The art was good, the writing was good, everything was good. It's like you sit down at a restaurant, the meal is decent. Did it fucking blow you away? No. Were my expectations high? Absolutely. Should you buy this? Yes. You said you said earlier that uh, Lonely Place of Dying didn't exactly blow you away, though, no. either. No, dude, but it, it brings me back to a time where I was a mm -hmm. little fucking snot-nosed punk that I could just hop on my bicycle, ride downtown, and pick myself up a fat stack of comic books. You know what I mean? In Webster. In Webster, Mass. I know, it's so weird to do that a Southern accent, right? How, how fucked up? I miss you, John. <laughs> I miss you. I used your weird accent. I'm sorry. But still, this was a good book. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to fucking fib. I'm not going to try to, like, stroke my own ego and say, back in the day, it was better than today. Get that flaming bag of poop off my front porch. It was decent. Okay? It wasn't bad. But was it great? Absolutely not. I'm not going to convince you. I'm sure of that. I think it's incomplete. I think it's too soon to say it's not great. Okay, I think it's... and that's fine, Sean. I understand everything now nowadays is a slow burn, right? It takes time to develop. I get it. Did this knock my socks off? No. Was it good? Yes. Okay? Can you admit the same? Can you at least say the same fucking thing? Yes. Like, okay. Yes. Okay, I'm glad you shouted yes. that out. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Okay, fantastic. Yes, it's good. It's not great. It's good. I enjoy it. I like the art. I like the story. It's good that Eddie Barrows is back. He had been gone away for a long time. Um, but you're right. It's not great. It's not the end-all be-all. I, I, I think it's going to be very good when it's all said and done. I trust the writer. Even though me as a critic, I can't fucking whip my dick out over this book i can say that it's decent enough that you should definitely check it out is that not fair i agree that is fair. fair you're absolutely fair all right sean listen i want to thank you so much for being on the show i appreciate it. i love our conversations it's been a lot of fun for me too i want to thank everybody else for tuning in listening to me and sean ramble on about comics from now from 
all these years ago, everything else. That's what we'd love to do, man. We'd love to talk comic books, and I hope you enjoyed it. So until next week. Night. Parlapod, visit parlapod.com. We're also available on the gww.com radio network, and we air every Wednesday at 10 p.m. on podcastradionetwork.net. You can also talk comics with us anytime you'd like by visiting our social media at Twitter and Facebook. Just search at Parlapod. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. All audio clips and sounds used on this show are rights of their respective owners. Now what the hell are you doing still listening to this podcast for? Get out there and read some comics.